So welcome everyone, good evening. My name is Pamela Flick. I'm the California Program Director for Defenders of Wildlife based in Sacramento. And um, I, uh, if you didn't hear me say already, I tend to have some bandwidth issues when I'm both sharing my screen and on camera. So please forgive me, I'm, I've turned my camera off for the presentation, but I will be back for the Q&A session at the end. Um, please, if you do have questions throughout, um, please, enter them into the chat. Um, I've got about 30 slides or so, so I would, um, I'm, I plan to just kind of crank through these and um, there's a lot to cover. Um, and so hold on and, um, you know, hang on for a, the ride and hopefully we'll get through this in about 40 or so minutes and then I will uh, open it up to Q&A. So with that, um, I have advanced my slide. Do you see the second slide, Robert? Yes, I can see it. Excellent. Okay, so it's all it's all working. So that's great. Um, for those of you not familiar with Defenders of Wildlife, we are a national nonprofit organization that is dedicated to the protection of native wildlife and their natural communities. Uh, this month, we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of our organization. We were founded as Defenders of Fur Bearers to try to end the slaughter of our nation's fur bearing species. But since then, we've expanded our mission to work on critters with scales, feathers, and as of course, fur. Our headquarters uh, office is in Washington, D.C., and as I mentioned, I'm in Sacramento, which serves as the headquarters for our California program, which has a full staff of six, and we currently have an additional four consultants. Defenders is also a proud founding member of the Pacific Wolf Coalition, which is a network of more than 30 organizations working to further wolf recovery in Washington, Oregon, and California. So here's a quick roadmap of where we will be headed tonight in our presentation. Um, I will cover gray wolf natural history, gray wolf distribution in North America, reintroduction as a tool for recovery of the species, current wolf populations in North America, wolves and the Endangered Species Act, and then we'll drill down to wolves here in California. I'll also talk about the implications for recovery in the Western United States, moving beyond myths, and the importance of coexisting with wolves and strategies for conflict reduction, and lastly, the vision of future wolf recovery. <clears throat> So a little about natural history of wolves. They are the largest member of the canine or dog family, AKA canids. And uh, they range in color from grizzled white, black and uh, grizzled gray, black and white, and a lot in between. In fact, some individuals in coastal British Columbia have pink coats, uh, pinkish coats, due to the large percentage of salmon in their diet, um, which I found fascinating. I don't know about you, but I would love to see a pinkish hued wolf in the wild. Um, they tend to, um, males tend to run a little bit uh, larger than females, and they are roughly 26 to 38 inches at shoulder height with females uh, ranging between 20 to 30 inches on average. Um, and they typically weigh between 60 and 120 pounds. Uh, the tall tail, tails of beast-like wolves weighing 250 pounds are just simply unfounded in reality. Uh, the largest documented wolf in the lower 48 was 141 pounds, and the wildlife biologist that captured that wolf estimated that he had between 15 and 20 pounds of meat in his belly. He had just eaten. Um, other large wolves in North America include a 175 pound individual in interior Alaska back in 1939 and a 172 pounder in Jasper National Park in Canada. Um, they are most often confused with coyotes, um, uh, which have similar coloration to the gray mottled wolf, um, but they tend to be much smaller. And I've included a depiction of wolf, a wolf coyote and a red fox to give you an idea of the difference in size of these wild canids, as well as comparative tracks to a wolf, a domestic dog, and a coyote. And of course, domestic dogs come all in literally just about every shape and size um, imaginable. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, wolves typically eat uh, large hooved uh, mammals called ungulates that include elk and deer. Um, their native prey also can include smaller species like beavers and rabbits, and they tend to uh, eat the smaller, smaller prey, uh, especially when they're individuals traveling or dispersing on their own. Um, but wolves are also opportunistic and they will scavenge dead animals that had died from starvation, injury, or disease. 
Um, wolves travel, live, and hunt in groups, uh, families known as packs, and those are generally four to seven animals on average, but larger packs um, have been known but are somewhat rare. The largest documented pack in the lower 48 was the Druid Pack of Yellowstone National Park at 37 members strong back in 2000. Um, larger packs can take down larger prey, such as preferentially going after a moose instead of a deer. You have more mouths to feed, it's advantageous to take down a larger prey in one kill. <clears throat> Excuse me, packs include the breeding or alpha pair, uh, their pups, and several other sub subordinate uh, individuals or younger animals, including some young of the year from previous seasons. They tend to breed in mid February. It's kind of easy to remember that wolves are generally looking for love around Valentine's Day, and they have their pups or whelp. Uh, typically in mid to late April after a gestation period of just over two months. And they will move their pups from the natal den where the where the wolves were, um, where the pups were born to what are called rendezvous sites as the pups get bigger and more mobile and can travel longer distances. The photo here um, on the left of pups is actually California's first contemporary pack. Um, and that's the Shasta pack, which had five pups. So um, wolves were once common throughout most of North America, but were driven to localized extinction in most of the areas um, of the United States by the mid 1930s through bounties and predator control efforts that were wildly successful. A bounty is simply a payment of a cash fee for each dead wolf or wolf pelt or skin. The first documented wolf bounty in North America was passed by the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630, and the spread of bounties across the continent paralleled the westward expansion of, of uh, European civilization. Um, the last known wolf bounty was uh, in Ontario, Canada, and I was very surprised and somewhat disappointed to learn that it wasn't repealed until 1972, which for some of us doesn't seem like that long ago um, in the big scheme of things. It's difficult to know how many, how many wolves have been killed in North America. But one estimate from Montana alone between the years of 1883 and 1918 was more than 80,000 wolves, 80,000 80, wolves in Montana in just a few decades. It's kind of mind boggling. So this map um, depicts a uh, gray wolf distribution in North America. Um, gray wolves range have, um, the range of wolves has been generally reduced to Canada and most of Alaska. And then gray wolves are also found in a variety of states listed on this slide. So the map depicts um, in the darker green, the historical range of, um, excuse me, the darker is the occupied range and the historical range where wolves have been found in the past but no longer are present is in the light green, which you may or may not be able to discern is almost all of North America. It's all, almost all of the contiguous United States and much of inland Mexico, uh, minus the Baja Peninsula. And then this red um, crosshatch throughout the southern and central Rockies and down the spine of the Cascade and Mount, uh, Sierra mountain ranges, um, that's suitable habitat, but unoccupied, although this map is slightly outdated and um, some of the suitable habitat is now in fact uh, occupied with cases including um, northeastern California, south central Oregon, and portion of northern Colorado. So um, let's talk about reintroduction as a tool for recovery. So the reco recovery is, is a process by which the decline of an endangered or threatened species is arrested or reversed, or threats to the species are neutralized so that its long-term survival in nature can be assured. Back in the mid 1990s, Fish and Wildlife Service worked with the National Park Service to reintroduce 66 individual wolves to Yellowstone National Park and the central Idaho wilderness. And that, in doing so, that augmented a very small native population of gray wolves in northwestern Montana. 
Wolves were also reintroduced to the southwest deserts of western New Mexico and eastern Arizona, um, and that was the subspecies, the Mexican gray wolf. <clears throat> So current estimates, uh, population estimates in North America, roughly 60,000 in Canada, between 7,000 and 11,000 gray wolves in Alaska. Um, those, those estimates are very large, of course, because in those areas, they are not considered endangered. And so there are not um, as closely monitored uh, there in Canada and Alaska as they are in the lower 48 because of the listing um, and delisting and subsequent listing, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, the Great Lakes population of gray wolves is roughly about 4,000 individuals in Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Um, you may have heard uh, that after delisting uh, that there were um, hundreds of wolves killed legally, harvested legally through Wisconsin's wolf hunt, um, and that around a, 100 additional wolves were illegally killed, um, which actually represented a loss of about one third of that state's entire wolf population when they were delisted in 2020. Um, moving to the Northern Rockies states of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, there's roughly 2,000 individuals there. In Oregon and Washington, there are about 350 wolves, and they are still pretty nascent populations that have only been there for just over a decade or so um, uh, in, in considerable numbers. And then minimum counts um, for California are 16. That's the minimum count that California Department of Fish and Wildlife, CDFW, has confirmed that they know of. Um, certainly could be additional wolves out there that are not monitored, uh, uncollared, et cetera. There are eight known wolves living in Colorado at this time. And we just had the Mexican gray wolf uh, population count. And happy to say that that population is up about 5% in the United States, um, just under 200, and then another roughly 40 in Chihuahua, Mexico. And again, Mexican gray wolves are a subspecies of gray wolves. So let's talk a little bit about wolves in the Endangered Species Act, or the ESA. It's a federal law. Um, wolves have had a number of legal status changes over the years. They were originally listed as endangered of becoming extinct under the federal ESA in 1974. There have been numerous lawsuits and various decisions over wolf legal status um, since 2004 and um, as recently as just two months ago. Um, Delisting proposals have failed, then succeeded, then failed again. Um, most recently in February of this year, a federal district court uh, restored federal protections to wolves in the lower 48 in the 44 states where they had not previously been delisted. Um, that overturned a Trump administration decision in um, November of 2020 to delist the population. Um, I will also note that regrettably Congress uh, back in 2011, I believe it was, legislatively delisted the Northern Rockies distinct population segment or DPS. And that was very concerning um, because that was a precedent that was set. Um, we have never had um, a political decision drive a, a delisting of a species from the endangered species list. So moving closer to home, <clears throat> which I'm sure most folks on this um, call are very interested about, um, Wolf OR7 um, made history just over 10 years ago when he became the first known wild wolf to step paw in California in nearly 90 years. Um, he is dubbed OR7 because he was the seventh wolf collared by Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, ODFW. And um, our seven story really struck out uh, or stuck out, I think, to many of us, besides the fact that it was um, newsworthy that we had a native predator return to the state after a long absence and to return to the state under his own wolf power was truly um, a, a headline that was celebrated by many conservationists, including those of us at Defenders of Wildlife. 
he wandered more than 2,000 miles from his home pack in northeastern um, Oregon, the Amnaha pack. And um, he in that 2,000 miles where he came down through the core of Oregon, um, he also uh, wandered a, at least eight counties in Northern California for nearly a year and a half before he returned to Southern Oregon. And um, he eventually found a mate. A lot of us thought he was looking for love in all the wrong places, but um, he did in fact find just what he was looking for. And he found a mate and they settled into the upper Rogue River watershed. Um, some people think they were named the Rogue Pack because he was a wild and crazy wolf. Um, but in fact, he was named for the, um, the watershed namesake. Um, and uh, the <clears throat> Rogue Pack was originally announced in June of 2014. And they have effectively become California's puppy mill. And several of OR7's descendants have made, um, made their way into the Golden State. So back in August of 2015, the Shasta Pack was announced by CDFW and um, again, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And they were, um, while they were called the Shasta Pack because they were, um, they were living in the shadows of Mount Shasta in Siskiyou County. Some, some folks are confused. They thought that they actually lived in Shasta County, but they were in fact in Siskiyou County. Um, and the pack consisted of breeding adults and five pups, which I mentioned previously. And all of them were this black coloration. So they were they were um, somewhat of an anomaly just because they were the first contemporary wolf pack in California in nearly a century. But they were all very dark in coloration, which was also, I don't know, just pretty neat. Um, the Shasta pack uh, bred for only that one year and then dissolved. Um, and their disappearance still remains a mystery, but it happened not long after they were discovered eating a calf of um, livestock. And um, only one of their members, a juvenile male, um, was detected after that. And um, <laughs> He was in Northwest Nevada. Someone actually saw him and took a video of him and then reported it to uh, Nevada Department of Wildlife and Dow. And they went back and they found some scat and they did a DNA analysis and found that he was in fact a Shasta Pack uh, male juvenile. But since then, the Shasta Pack has not been heard of. I've also um, noted here that in December of 2016, California, um, uh, released a final California wolf conservation plan. And I would like to give props to CDFW for inviting a wide range of stakeholders, including conservationists, hunters, uh, livestock industry representatives, and academics to the table to help them identify issues and advise them on the development of this wolf plan. Um, of course, because we have not had a um, wolf population in California um, before, you know, 2011, except for way long ago. Um, this was the first statewide wolf uh, management and conservation plan, and I truly feel that um, it is better because of the collaborative work that was undertaken by all of the stakeholders. So currently, the legal status of wolves in California is endangered both under the federal ESA as well as CESA, the California Endangered Species Act. So moving on to the Lassen Pack. So um, in August of 2015, just about the same time the Shasta Pack was announced, CDFW also announced that there was a lone female, quote, wolf-like canid that was detected on a trail camera in Lassen County. The following, um, following late winter, the lone female had found a friend. And then in summer of 17, the last impact was announced. So it was really exciting to see that yet another wolf had come down um, to California. Um, her origins were less clear. And um, I, if I remember correctly, I believe that the DNA analysis shows that she's most, most related to Northern Rockies wolves um, from the Idaho area. And so the last impact um, originally announced in 2017, they had pups and they have successfully reproduced um, each year since then, um, through last year, they've had um, five, 
five years, six litters, um, at, with a total of 28 pups. And um, you heard that right, five years, six litters. Um, in 2020, they actually had two litters of pups. There was um, the original alpha male um, had uh, not been seen for a while. And so there was a new, uh, new male on the scene and he bred with the original alpha female. And he also bred with a two year old offspring from the Lassen pack. So um, while some people may raise their eyebrows thinking inbreeding occurred because the, the new male was not from the Lassen pack, he just happened to, um, to breed with two of the Lassen females. Um, so they actually had nine uh, pups in two litters in 2020, and then six pups last year. It remains to be seen if they re successfully reproduce this year, but I, if I was a betting woman, I would say I would probably say yes. Um, let's see, anything else on this? Um, moving on to more recent arrivals, uh, OR85, again, um, the 85th wolf to be collared by Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife came down from Northeastern Oregon from the Mount Emily pack. And um, it was exciting to see a wolf from a different pack in Northeastern Oregon and um, somebody that doesn't have the same uh, roots or genetics as OR7 in the rogue pack to get some genetic diversity. Um, he came in, uh, OR85 came into California in November of 2020. And he, again, met up with an uncolored female. Um, and that female is closely related to the rogue pack up in Oregon, OR7's pack. And these two successfully reproduced in two, 2021 and had seven pups. Um, and that created the whaleback pair. And the whaleback pair are in Siskiyou County and are occupying a portion of the um, historical territory that was occupied by the Shasta pack, the first contemporary pack. Um, also note, noteworthy were three individual wolves that were all captured on a trail camera in May of 2021 in southern Plumas County. Um, they, were they were dubbed the Beckworth pack and pre preliminary DNA analysis indicates that um, one of those individuals is a Lassen pack female that was um, born in 2019. The other two wolves um, origin of the Beckworth pack remain unknown and it is unknown if they successfully reproduced last year. Um, and then lastly, I'll just note OR, uh, 103 uh, entered into northeastern Siskiyou County in May of 2021. He is notable because he has crossed Interstate 5 multiple times and has spent a considerable amount of time on the west side of the highway. Um, OR 103 was colored by ODFW in Deschutes County, but his pack origin is also currently unknown. Um, these photos here, um, 103 is on the bottom left. He actually has an injured right front paw and he's a little bit of a hobbled wolf, but he's still getting around. Um, and the photos, uh, the photo on the bottom right is the whale back pair um, and some pups and uh, OR 85 is in the upper right. So to give you an idea spatially of where these wolves are located on our landscape, um, here is an approximate area of gray wolf activity map from the from CDFW, which was updated in January of 2022. Whaleback pair being up north, our northernmost um, pack of wolves in Siskiyou County, Shasta. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but Shasta, uh, Mount Shasta is right about um, midline on that um, southwest side. And then going south and east is the Lassen Pack, our longest uh, running pack at this point. And they straddle the Lassen and Plumas County line and um, typically spend their winters in, um, in the Plumas County area and their summers in the Lassen County, which is a little bit higher um, elevation. And then uh, the Beckworth pack, which has not been detected for quite a few months now, um, was in the Southern Plumas area. So I will also talk about two other notable wolves. Um, hopefully I'm doing okay on time. Let me check really quickly. <clears throat> 
so OR54 uh, was born into the rogue pack, OR7's pack, in 2016. She was the 54th collared wolf in Oregon and was collared in 2017. And she entered California in January of 2018. She visited at least nine counties and she returned twice to Oregon, one of which, uh, one of those return trips, she went all the way north almost to Bend. So if you're familiar with the geography of, of Oregon, that is a good haul, um, you know, almost halfway um, up through Oregon and then back down to California. She is noteworthy because not only because of her extremely long journey of more than 8,700 straight line miles in between her GPS coordinates um, from her tracking collar, but she also crossed um, Interstate 80 and uh, went south to near Incline Village and actually crossed over into Nevada. There have been a number of um, wolf sightings in Nevada, but as far as I know, there are no resident wolf populations in our neighboring state to the east. Um, unfortunately, OR7 uh, was found dead in Shasta County in, back in February of 2020. Um, this is, you know, this is sad because she had, um, she had given a lot of folks hope. Uh, she was a beacon of hope, having followed her father's paw prints uh, around northeastern California, and some thought that she may someday become an alpha uh, female of California's second pack, um, perhaps one farther south in the Sierra Nevada. Um, her, the cause of her death remains under investigation. And then more recently, OR93 uh, made quite a few headlines. He was born into the White River Pack, uh, which was up near Mount Hood in north central um, Oregon. And we were really excited to, to know that he was um, he had made his way down to California because once again, um, more new genetics for wolves, which is a good thing, um, biologically speaking. He was the 93rd collared wolf um, in Oregon in 2020. He entered California in January of last year in Modoc County. And he traveled uh, nearly 90, 935 air miles here, just here in California. And notably, he he um, was discovered to be in Mono County at one point. So, you know, from Modoc County, made it down to, to Mono County. And then um, probably particularly of interest to the folks at Fresno Audubon Society, I'm sure you saw the headlines, that from, Mod from Mono County, he crossed over the Sierra Nevada Crest and down into the Central Valley, visited Fresno County before striking across the San Joaquin Valley, crossing both Highway 99 and I-5, and then over into San Benito County, crossed uh, uh, US 101 and made it into Monterey County and his collar finally um, stopped pinging in early April of last year. And so um, it was not giving off a mortality signal. So um, the, the assumption was that is, the batteries just simply died, which happens um, unfortunately more commonly than we would love. Um, but then he was detected on a trail camera on private land in, um, in Kern County, um, somewhat near the Tehachapi um, mountains. And then even further south, he was, there were several reports of a wolf in Ventura County. And this was so exciting because this is by far the farthest south any wolf has come, um, has gone in California um, in, you know, in over a century, as far as we know. So again, a sad tale. I think a lot of us were hoping that, um, you know, OR93 would find uh, a mate as well and settle into suitable but um, unoccupied territory farther south. But while the stories of both OR54 and OR93 had sad endings, they still remain a symbol of hope. Wolves are wildly resilient and can make long dispersal um, travels in search of meat and territory. So this, um, this map gives you, should give you a sense of where wolves have roamed in California um, thus far. And uh, you know, it just gives you a sense of the collared wolves um, that have been tracked by ODFW, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, with their collared wolves. So the purple uh, line that extends over the Sierra Crest into Mono County and then across the across the Sierra, down into the Fresno area, across to San Benito, and then down into San Luis Obispo is really, um, I think, the most fascinating. Um, the yellow kind of mustard color is OR54, so that's OR93 in the purple, and then OR uh, 
54 uh, or seven's daughter that made so many thousands of miles, um, bounced around so much. She went down into the somewhat the lower elevations of the Sierra foothills. And then this is a variety of other wolves that have been collared and tracked. So let's talk about implications for recovery in the Pacific West. Um, so when and where wolves have been delisted, aggressive hunting of wolves and lethal control has occurred and driven their populations um, down. I already gave the example of Wisconsin, which took out um, you know, approximately one third of its entire wolf's uh, population in just a handful of days through a legal hunt. And uh, some of the practices of aggressive wolf management in, um, in other states, like in the Northern Rocky states, Idaho and Montana and Wyoming, um, are really going to reduce population so much that um, it has implications for the, the Pacific West because those populations were so um, those lands, that territory were so saturated that it really pushed more new wolves out to unoccupied territory. And so that has um, created the populations in eastern Washington and eastern Oregon that have fed the very nascent population here in California and in south central Oregon. Um, so, you know, what happens in the Northern Rockies, while it might seem like a really long ways from here, um, it really does have implications for wolf recovery here in California. So, um, I'd like to just talk really briefly about moving beyond myths. I'm sure we've all heard about, you know, heard the Little Red Riding Hood story. We've heard of the three little pigs and the big bad wolf always kind of gets um, maligned in, in myths and in stories. The wolf is not a, a, as evil of a creature as le legends and uh, myth and misinformation would lead you to believe. Um, sure, they are an apex predator that is a carnivore and they make a living by killing other animals in order to survive. That's what they do. But wolves are also very timid creatures and most will run from humans before we even know they're anywhere near us. Um, also, I think noteworthy with, you know, upwards of 70,000 gray wolves being estimated in North America and more than 350 million humans sharing the same landscapes, you'd think that wolf-human conflicts would be relatively common. Well, they are not. Um, there are only two known cases of gray wolves killing humans. One was a jogger in Alaska, and the other was a hiker in Saskatchewan, Canada. And that one is even not 100% verified, as some investigators thought that that hiker was actually killed by a grizzly. Um, and then just, you know, wolves were seen in the vicinity. Um, so most of the wolf's bad rap come from the fact that they're sometimes found to take down livestock. So let's talk about threats to livestock for a minute. So I lifted this, um, this graphic from the Sierra Club and it's based on 2010 National Agricultural Statistics Survey data, um, which, you know, is admittedly a little bit old, um, but that kind of data only comes around once every 10 years. And I haven't seen another um, graphic like this. And these percentages do not change significantly. So I, I'm sticking with it. Um, so if, I don't know if you can see this, but you know, at the front of the, the cow, you see respiratory problems, roughly 26%. Other unidentified health problems, 18% of you know, um, causes of, this is, these are causes of mortality in, in livestock. Digestive problems make up 13%, weather 12%. You know, um, uh, thunder, lightning, lightning has been known to, to take out herds of cows. Um, calving problems, disease, injury, all of these relatively natural um, mortality factors take up a huge, vast majority of uh, mortality sources for livestock. And then when we get back into the hindquarters, we're talking about coyotes and other um, predators, pumas, bobcats, unidentified carnivores, domestic dogs even, um, and then bears and wolves. These make up a fraction of 1%. Coyotes make up three, wolves make up 0.2%. Um, but, you know, with all of this said, I do want to note that predation can have a disproportionate impact on specific individual livestock producers, especially where wolves get bad habits and perpetuate them by training their offspring. And that's why conflict reduction measures to further coexistence between wolves and livestock is critically important. 
So Defenders has um, worked on trying to further coexistence um, and ensure that wolves and livestock can share the landscape um, peacefully for many, many years. Um, we have managed a number of uh, conflict reduction um, projects. We have hosted workshops. We have funded a variety of tactics for non-lethal coexistence tools, which are proven to be effective at preventing wolf depredations of livestock. There's a variety of things that can be done, including disposal of attractants like carcasses, um, bone piles or pits, and ensuring that sick animals are taken from the, from the range and doctored um, you know, at the earliest opportunity. Uh, specialized fencing such as flattery and turbo flattery, which um, put simply is um, a rope with flags on it. Usually brightly colored flags tend to be red or bright orange. Turbo flattery is on a poly wire. So it adds electricity, a little bit of a shock if the wolves are finally become so brave that they um, come up to it and like any pet uh, dog would stick their wet nose on it to investigate and they'll get a shock. Um, Increasing human presence on the range, just not only to keep track of where um, predations may have occurred, where um, predators might be present, but also to make sure that the livestock are healthy, there are no sick or injured animals out there, and they can get doctored if need be. The use of livestock guardian dogs is a popular tactic as well, um, especially with certain classes or types of livestock like sheep and goats. And then scare tools and tactics, including alarms, fox lights, which which are um, essentially like a strobe light that's randomized um, and non-lethal ammunition also include, um, are also included in the toolbox. So reducing attractants is really important. Um, like many canids, wolves have an incredibly keen sense of smell and can detect prey um, more than two miles away. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, dead, diseased, or dying, dying animals can be attractants for scavengers, and um, you know these predators easily identify those as vulnerable prey and will come um, in search of them. So it's important that livestock producers haul away or bury livestock carcasses, and I recognize that that's easier, e more easily said than done, especially in areas where wolves are um, occupying in California, such as the um, Modoc and Lassen area, which is highly volcanic and the soil is incredibly hard. Um, but it's also possible to fence in carcass pits, um, you know, bone piles or even individual car carcasses. Um, there, that has been um, proven to be effective at uh, keeping the predators away and not giving them an easy meal, which is really, really important. Um, there are also calving strategies to, um, to reduce conflicts since calves are highly vulnerable and the afterbirth actually tends to be, um, be a, an attractant as well. Uh, some ranchers uh, use calving camps or bringing, bringing the um, pregnant animals into a more um, concentrated area for calving or even scheduling calving for times when other prey is abundant. And again, I recognize that that is more easily said than done. Um, uh, there are just about as many different unique ways of raising livestock as there are ranchers out there and um, not everyone can easily, you know, s turn their operation on a dime to change when they um, when their calving season occurs. Barriers, including fence, flattery, and penning, have been also found to be very effective to deter predators. Night penning is often used by sheep herders where they can herd their flock into a smaller area and um, put up a, a either flattery or an electrified fence, and the sheep will gather at night and be more protected, especially if there's a herder with them or a range rider that uh, beds down next to them. Um, flattery, again, here's a photo of the brightly colored flags hanging next to an existing barbed wire fence. Um, the turbo front flattery with the electrified um, line comes in handy, um, particularly when, um, when uh, it's used, you know, it, it's up for months, but it tends to be more successful uh, at night when wolves are more likely to prey on livestock. And there are a lot of really great um, trail cameras, a uh, lot of shots that I've seen of wolves just pacing back and forth along, you know, a, a good stretch of a fence line that has flattery and they just will not, they will not cross it. Um, I think a lot of the researchers tend to think that it's just a novel stimulus and the fact that the flags 
um, kind of flap around freely in the wind um, just spooks the, the wolves and they're not willing to cross it. Um, Portable fencing for large for moving um, larger operations, you know, where they can uh, do um, very targeted grazing of a pasture and then use the fencing around a smaller herd has also been found to be effective. <coughs> Excuse me. Increasing human presence, as I mentioned, is also very important. Um, range riders, as indicated here, you know, there's there's um, good old cowboy on on horseback, but um, they've also been known to use off highway vehicles, ORVs, or even just regular vehicles, and um, and just keep an eye on the herd and also to track um, when a predator has been known to be in the area. I mentioned the use of live livestock guardian dogs. Um, often um, uh, referred to as big white dogs. Uh, there are a variety of breeds that are large, uh, large white dogs and they tend to um, uh, flock with the sheep. Uh, I don't know if they think that they're sheep, but they do a really good job of protecting their sheep. They're very, very, um, they're, they, they tend to uh, take the sheep flock on as their own. Um, and then I already discussed the scare tactics um, and tools, alarms. There's a thing called a rag box, a radio activated guard box or a mag box, motion activated guard box that has um, a radio in it and it makes sounds like machine guns or helicopter. Somewhat, sometimes they play NPR, human voices. They have a randomized strobe light um, to kind of mimic having um, a human out on the on the range with a flashlight. So whatever you can do to deter um, predators. Let's see, I only have a couple more slides, um, Robert. So hopefully I'm still doing okay on time. <clears throat> So uh, the importance of coexistence, um, you know, as I mentioned, if and where um, wolves have been or will be listed in the future, non-lethal coexistence tools for conflict reduction um, will be more important than ever. Um, where lethal control or, you know, where there is um, management that allows for lethal take of wolves, um, it, we must encourage conflict reduction measures to protect livestock and to prevent unnecessary killing wolves. We do not want to see wolves killed be because of livestock, and we don't want to see livestock killed by wolves. Um, it's really that simple. Um, wolves are opportunistic, and it's critically important that we make it harder for them to attack and prey on livestock. So these conflict reduction measures um, are, are created to try to do just that. And honestly, per, um, you know, Protecting uh, wolf, or excuse me, protecting livestock through conflict reduction measures really pays off in the long run. Um, nature abhors a vacuum, and in cases where so-called problem wolves have been removed, um, lethally killed, and taken off the off the landscape um, for attacking livestock, other wolves almost always tend to move into that area um, and kill, continue to kill livestock if poor husbandry techniques are used. So it's really important that we get to the root cause of the conflicts and try to reduce those conflicts whenever possible. So defenders recognized long ago the economic burden of wolves returning to the landscape that, and that falls on the shoulders of livestock producers. So um, we pioneered a compensation program to reimburse ranchers for livestock losses due to wolf attacks. So confirmed or probable um, losses through formal investigations of depredations. Um, and uh, we kind of pivoted to, um, instead of uh, working on compensation um, a number of years ago, we, we tried to take more of an upstream approach to conflict reduction, and we, um, we helped to found a pay for presence program for Mexican gray wolves in the southwestern United States, where um, we're actually incentivizing ranchers to share the landscape with, uh, with wolves. And we're exploring similar concepts to stand up a California pay for presence program currently. Uh, 
Um, I participate in the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's working group. Um, we actually were able to get $3 million earmarked in the California state budget to be spent over the next three years to create and stand up a wolf livestock demonstration project or a pilot program for compensation that could include a pay for presence um, component. But in the meantime, the department, California Department of Fish and Wildlife has uh, created a direct loss compensation program for any ranchers or livestock producers who have um, who have had confirmed or probable loss uh, losses um, investigated and determined since September of last year, which is when those appropriations became available through the budget. So lastly, um, the vision of wolf recovery um, in the future. You know, I'm returning back to the slide with the red crosshatch of suitable wolf habitat. And from defender's standpoint, we have a lot of suitable habitat out there that is um, typically public lands farther from major human population centers that is um, ready, ripe for wolves to take uh, occupancy in, and they are just not there yet. So um, we feel that if wolves are delisted, it will become much, much harder for them to get there. And so um, we're really pleased to, to know that the decision um, of the Fish and Wildlife Service in 2020 has been um, recently reversed by federal district court and giving wolves a fighting chance to get into those areas identified on this map, including the central and southern Rockies and um, further into the Pacific West states, including here in California. So with that, uh, this is my last slide. Here's my contact information. I welcome you to um, reach out if you would like to learn more, if you have um, additional or you know, longer questions for me. And um, let me see, I'm going to, there's the end of my slideshow. So I'm gonna stop sharing and hopefully, oh, I can't start my, video because the host has stopped it. So it looks like Robert, you'll need to start my video. <laughs> Sorry for that little glitch. Um, while you're doing that, I'll look at the chat because I see there's a couple of chats. Um, Julie uh, asked if, uh, what did what did I say that the Shasta pack ate before disappearing? Um, the Shasta pack was uh, found eating a calf, a young cow, domestic livestock. Um, and <clears throat> it's interesting you ask that. Um, one of the theories, um, oh, here we go. I'm back. Um, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, one theory, uh, I was actually speaking with somebody over in Idaho and I said, you know, the Shasta pack hasn't been seen or heard of for a number of months. This was, you know, quite a few years ago. And I said, do you think someone shot him? And he, you know, he said, shot the whole pack, not a chance. And I was like, well, why do you say that? And he said, well, if you have somebody shoot, you know, a single gunshot, the wolves are going to scatter. And remember, there were seven of them. And so he had a good point. I hadn't really thought about that. You know, he didn't think that it was plausible that someone had shot each individual wolf. Um, of course, one was subsequently found in um, or seen in Nevada. Um, but there was a theory that someone may have tainted a carcass. Um, I'm not saying that happened. There's no evidence that I know of that that happened, but um, that has been a theory that's been tossed around. So um, hopefully that answers that question. And I'll stop here. Um, Robert, I don't know if you wanted to facilitate questions. Yeah, I'd be or happy to facilitate it. And um, we have a question that came directly to me from Colleen. Um, what are the pros and cons of collaring wolves? Oh, that's a great question, Colleen. Um, I am a proponent of collaring. Um, some of my conservation colleagues don't like the idea of collaring um, wolves because in some places they have been um, used, collar data has been used to find wolves to kill wolves. Um, I don't anticipate that that's going to be an issue here in California, at least for quite some time since they are listed under our California Endangered Species Act and there is no lethal control at this time. Um, so the advantages of having collared wolves is so that you know where they are. You can track them, you can, um, in CDFW often informs ranchers of um, wolf activity in or near either their home 
home pastures or in allotments that they lease from the federal government, primarily fish and, or excuse me, um, forest service or Bureau of Land Management lands. And so it's really important to know where the wolves are when you're trying to reduce conflicts. So that's one of the big, um, I think one of the big advantages of having collared wolves. Also um, really encouraging CDFW to have as many collars on, on wolves and known wolf packs as possible. The batteries don't last forever, just as with the case with OR93, his collar stopped working, um, probably because of battery life issues. And so if you have only one collared wolf in a pack and that collar goes silent, and the wolves pick up and move, you have no way of knowing where they went or how to inform um, ranchers or, or anyone you know, um, where those wolves are and how to reduce conflicts. So like I, like I said, I'm a big proponent. Um, the CDFW has, <clears throat> has tried to keep at least one live collar on each pack, um, but um, I, I would like to see them have more, more collars out there. Good. Uh, Nancy Gilmore asks, has the Beckworth pack been seen since the Dixie fire? Yes, I believe that. No, I'm sorry. I take that back. They are not within the footprint of the Dixie fire. The Lassen pack is. Um, Beckworth pack is a bit farther south. Um, I don't think that the Dixie fire extended into the area where the Beckworth pack was known to be, but the Lassen pack is definitely within that footprint and they have been seen. Um, I have kind of secondhand reports um, from folks that have had boots on the ground out there and said that um, in the area of the last impact territory, it's um, what they refer to as a mosaic of burn severity where some areas um, are really roasted, um, high severity, you know, a lot of mortality of the vegetation and severe soil more, um, severity. Um, and in other areas, it's practically untouched. There's still green forest. And um, the wolves, especially their, their den and rendezvous areas tend to be near water because wolves need water. Um, and especially when the pups are young, they can't travel very far. Once they are weaned, they need to be close to a water source. So it's, it's like they almost instinctively protect themselves from um, fire by choosing areas with water and that tend to just be moist. And um, so they definitely are still alive and well. Good, that's good to know going forward because we expect a lot more fires. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then Morgan asks, uh, there was an article on sfgate.com last week about ranchers in Northern California. It was discussed that some wolves become wise to the flavory, et cetera. And one rancher also said he had his carcass pile off of the main ranch in order to divert the wolves from the livestock. What are your thoughts on these two points? Yeah, so, um... <sighs> On the, the, the um, last point about the bone pits, I'm really torn about bone piles, and carcass pits, whatever you want to call them. Um, I did see that article and I saw the, the scattering of, um, of bones. So on one hand, um, if it satiates the wolves and they are able to make a living off of just eating those carcasses, typically like an individual wolf um, might do so. And OR7 was known to do that and other wolves that have traveled through areas with bone pits. Um, it subsidizes them and it could potentially kind of distract them or give them something to eat that, so that they don't have to kill live animals. That's a plus. A minus though, and I believe this was discussed in the, in the article, is that it serves as a major attractant. Um, I also mentioned in my in my presentation that OR7 or that um, the afterbirth uh, tends to also be an attractant. So calving pastures or lambing pastures are like, you know, a huge flag because the wolves are attracted not only to the afterbirth, but of course, to the very vulnerable newborns. Um, OR7 in his travels was going back and forth between a bone pit, traversing active uh, calving grounds going to a water source. And he continued to do that back and forth for a number of days. And of course, CDFW could track him because he had a collar. And so they went out to that producer and they said, we can see that this is a water source. What is this? They determined, you know, they found out that it was a carcass pit, 
the carcass pit got covered and um, he eventually moved on. Thankfully, he kept his snout clean and did not take any young. Um, he was probably uh, living off of the bone pits and subsidized um, feeding from the, from the afterbirths. So yeah. I'm really torn. I think that's a great question. I'm torn about um, kind of distractionary or subsidized feeding through the bone pits because they also serve as an attractant. And I'm sorry, I missed the first question, part of that question. Could you uh, the first part that? of the question was the uh, wolves becoming wise to the flavory. Oh, yes. So yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and I usually mention this. Um, wolves will become habituated to flattery. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on where you're at on the landscape and how frequently they have become, um, they have come close to it. Um, but typically between two and three months, it stays effective. But wolves are also bold. Um, while they're timid when it comes to, um, you know, approaching humans generally, they might stand and stare at you, but they, they typically won't approach unless there are some rare cases of wolves having ra um, rabies. But um, they will eventually, when they're habituated to something like flattery, they will eventually come up to it. And that's why the turbo flattery is um, an added little shocker mm -hmm. so that once they do get bold enough to come up to it, the very first thing they do is they touch their wet nose to it and it gives them that shock. So, um, but it's critically important that um, we don't put flattery up across all of Northern California or wherever wolves are. It's really, it, um, should be a more surgical use um, during the most highly vulnerable periods like calving and lambing um, or when you have you know very young animals that um, don't know the landscape and you can keep them um, bunched up together but you don't want to have flattery out 24 7 365. Okay we have another question from Nancy Gilmore. Is there a payment system for the ranchers to install items such as the fencing? You know, we're talking about that through the um, through the pilot program. There's money for direct losses. So for those ranchers that have experienced either a confirmed or probable kill from wolves, they can get directly comp um, compensated for the value, fair market value at auction price for the animal, even if it's two weeks old. Um, but then we're also talking about using some of those funds for non-lethal um, conflict reduction measures, including fencing, range riding, et cetera. So um, Defenders, you know, as an organization has also helped pay for those things. We've, we've ordered countless miles of flattery and provided it to CDFW or to USDA Wildlife Services, um, which is a program that the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, and they typically will have a, a county trapper in almost all counties, not every single county has them, but they're specialists at trapping and they know the landscape and they know the ranchers and livestock owners and the, the property owners really well. So we work closely with um, both CDFW and um, wildlife services to provide those kind of tools. And we're hopeful that this new pilot program will also include um, opportunities for ranchers to get those um, themselves. Good, that'd be good. Um, Cheryl Waterhouse asks, do wild wolves interbreed with coyotes and domestic dogs? Um, the coyotes, uh, the red wolf, which I didn't cover, um, red wolves are native to um, the eastern seaboard and they live currently in a very, very restricted range in, North, uh, in coastal North uh, Carolina. And they have been known to hybridize with coyotes. Um, I don't know of any instances of gray wolves um, hybridizing with coyotes. However, I have heard of wild wolves um, mating with domestic dogs. Not chihuahuas so much, but there have been uh, there have been some cases where the guardian dogs, the livestock guardian dogs, have um, have been impregnated by wolves. Interesting. <laughs> Brene asks, um, I recently heard that some range riders in Washington State have been driving um, perimeters of ranch lands, but not invested in doing their job 100%. Is there a remedy to ensure that the riders do their jobs with integrity? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. It's a little sticky question. Um, you know, I think it's really important that um, you know the the right people are hired for the job that have the personal work ethic to do the job right, um, and that they are very carefully logging um, all of their activities, and that there is some sort of monitoring mechanism 
put in place. Um, you know, I, I, I whether that's um, randomized visits, you know, where it's like, hey, we didn't announce that we're coming out to the ranch and, um, you know, or or to the allotment and we didn't see your range rider there um, or doing that a number of times. But um, it's it's really challenging. It really comes down to just having the right personnel with the right ethics. Maybe you could put tracking collars on. <laughs> <laughs> No comment. Karen, <laughs> Karen Cobb asks, I have had two experiences with wolves in Fresno County. In 1956, in an area now closed, either near the Rattlesnake or the Kaiser diggings, I was with my dad and raised my rifle, but dad put his hand on, brought the gun down. I was about 14. In the late 1980s, in the winter, on the way to skiing, on the way to China Peak near Tamarack Creek, between Shaver and Huntington, I saw a mostly white wolf, magnificent. Yeah, um, I have heard stories. Um, when OR7 first um, came across the border, I got a couple of um, emails, phone calls saying, why is, excuse me, why is this news? We've had uh, wolves in the Sierra Nevada for, for decades. I, I saw them when I was young. So certainly possible, mm -hmm. um, but wolves typically make themselves known. Um, whether they're by themselves, they howl, looking for mates, whether they're with their pack, they howl to, dis to discuss, you know, how things are going with their neighbor packs, um, to defend their territory and let other wolves know they're there. So um, seeing an individual wolf here, or wolf-like canid, I will say, mm -hmm. um, here and there, um, sadly, a lot of people adopt wolves or wolf dog hybrids. And even to the most trained wolf biologist's eye, some of those animals cannot be discerned, their genetics cannot be discerned by simply looking at the animal. Mm. Um, and I actually work with a woman who is a, an avid wolf lover um, and she has had um, wolf dogs and a wolf um, fully, fully bred wolf pet. Um, and I recall her telling me one time that she knew she had, she was out of her league when she came home and the dog had eaten most of her couch. <laughs> it wasn't just the cushions on her couch, but it was almost the whole thing. The dog had, the wolf had actually gnawed all the way down to the frame of the of the couch. Mm -hmm. They're wild animals and it's also pretty pricey to keep them in food. Um, mm -hmm. Most people will try to give them fresh meat, raw meat, and that's expensive when you're filling a dog's belly with raw meat. Mm -hmm. um, and so unfortunately, a lot of those animals, once the, the owners recognize that they're in over their heads, will release them back into the wild to do what's best for the animal, which is exactly the worst thing for the animal and mm -hmm. the worst thing for the environment into which they're releasing them. Um, so while I, I was not there in the Sierra, you know, I never try to tell people what they did or did not see, but it's highly, highly um, possible that the anim some of the individual animals that have been seen over the years have been either wolf or wolf hybrid um, pets that were released back into the wild, even though they were never there in the first place. Okay. The um, next one is a, um, is a compliment from Janine Mack and McGee saying, thank you for all of this interesting information and for Defenders of Wildlife, the work to save our wolves. Warriors for wolves. Warriors. Thank you, Janine. That's very nice of you to say. Appreciate Karen it. Karen Cobb says, post above about the two sightings is from Mike Cobb, posted by his wife, Karen Cobb. So there's a clarification <laughs> there. Fair enough. Lynn <laughs> Jeffrey says, I have been a member of Defenders of Wildlife for 30 plus years, and I am so proud of their wonderful work. The wolves are in good hands and will be protected by the conscientious and caring individuals of Defenders. I continue to support Defenders because I feel wolves are an integral part of our web of life. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for your very kind uh, words, and thank Waters you for your says, support. Yeah, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Um, okay. Melissa Water says, wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Yara Souza says, no questions, but as a young woman, nature enthusiast, I just wanted to participate and get more awareness on the concerns regarding the wolves conservation. And I deeply appreciate DWL for doing the beautiful work you do to protect <clears throat> the beautiful beings. Thank you, Yara. Uh, and again, Janine Mackin McGee says, we need to help to get ESL protection, the wolves in the Rockies to help our West Coast wolves. 
Yeah, I agree. So um, I'm guessing ESL means a species endangered species listing. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned, I didn't dwell on it, but um, the Northern Rocky Mountain distinct population segment, the national, aka the Northern Rockies DPS, was congressionally delisted. Um, it was a political decision not based on science and it's very unfortunate and it has stuck. Um, so when I mentioned that this recent court decision um, reinstated federal protections for most of the uh, wolves in the lower 48, it did not include the wolves in the Northern Rockies DPS. And um, I agree, I mean, some of the very aggressive wolf management, um, hunting, snaring, um, just things that even the the best of the uh, hunters, the most ethical hunters would not um, say is fair hunt or fair chase. Um, it, it's really, really um, just sad and unethical and um, it's it's really terrible. And quite honestly, uh, what the, many of those states, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming would really like to hunt their wolf populations down to a, essentially 151 wolves per state, which is one wolf above the threshold for delisting for those states. Elaine asks or says that the legislation that delisted the Northern Rockies wolves was a budget rider. Does that budget rider have an expiration date and can be overridden by the Department of Interior if they relist the wolves nationally? That's a good question. question. That's a good, um, good point, Colleen. I don't think that that budget rider has, a, um, unfortunately, does not have an expiration date. I wish that it did. <laughs> that would have been the best part of bad legislation. Um, and it just kind of underscores the importance of having, um, you know, dedicated professional advocates watching um, all of the bad things that get into bills, must pass bills like appropriations. Um, and um, I don't, uh, your question about the Department of Interior relisting wolves nationally, um, there is a lot of adv advocacy around not only restoring wolf populations to those 44 states, but also to the Northern Rockies. Candace uh, Dyer asks, I have a tricky question. It was mentioned that one of the wolf deaths was still being investigated. How long do these investigations take on average? There have been rewards of $30,000 put up for any information on the poisoning of several wolves in Oregon and the wiping out of an entire pack. But I'm wondering just how seriously the departments are going after these poachers, looking for evidence pointing to the culprits. <clears throat> Illegal killing seems to be escalating, especially over just the past couple of years. Also, thank you so much for putting together this presentation, so informative and well done. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I think it's a really good, uh, point made around illegal killing. Um, poaching is, it just should not be um, allowed, not tolerated. Um, I can say for sure that CDFW and their law enforcement division takes these crimes very seriously. Um, there have been a number of inquiries and um, uh, on, on the, these two wolf deaths in particular. Um, one I didn't mention, and I'm sorry, I forgot wh which OR it was, but um, 50 something, I might be able to pull it up, um, that is also under investigation. So OR 54, who was found um, in Shasta in 2020, um, is not the only wolf investigation that's under um, that's being undertaken at this time. Let's see, OR 59. So he was a male wolf from Northeastern Oregon um, and he crossed into Modoc County in December of 2008. Um, he was killed just a few days later. Um, so they consider that a poaching incident, poaching, you know, illegal killing. And that is also under, um, under investigation. So, you know, it's, it's a totally unsatisfying answer, but investigations take as long as they take, um, you know, and sometimes they never find out who did it. You know, some, it, sometimes they're hoping that somebody's going to maybe have one too many beers at the local, you know, watering hole and start talking about something. And so sometimes those are very opportunistic opportunities, um, you know, for uh, members of the, of the larger community to hear something and say something. Um, but that doesn't always happen, especially in some of these smaller, really um, closely knit communities. So um, unfortunately, there's just no way of saying it's not, um, I have never heard the department say we've investigated for five years, we didn't find anything case closed. 
So they are ongoing until there is some kind of resolution or there's not. So I, I'm just as unsatisfied with my answer as probably you all are. <laughs> yeah. It is what it is, I guess, huh? Yeah. Um, Lilith says, I'm in Ventura. Thank you, President Audubon, for this presentation. Kathy Phillips says, thank you. And Renee says, a comment, everyone across the US and globally, please keep calling Interior Secretary Halen to uh, plead for emergency listing to ESL. Phone number is 202-208-3100, extension three. Um, Secretary Halen is the boss of the US FWS, so your phone calls are essential. Please call weekly. We need a groundswell of calls to let Secretary Halen hear us loud. That's all the questions. I wanna thank you again so much. I, we're a little bit over tonight, so I'm not going to spend too much more time talking about our upcoming events, but I would like everyone to know that we still have room on our upcoming bird walks and birding classes that are out at the River Center. And if you're interested, you can go to our calendar and you can register there for those events. And I encourage you to do so. They're a lot of fun. And thank you again very much, Pam. It was very nice to have you. It was an excellent presentation. And everyone, this presentation will be posted on our YouTube site in a day or two. So thanks again. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Be well.